This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation along with answers are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit www.aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit www.aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar entitled, What is PNH from Diagnosis to Treatment? Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lee Clark, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge the generous support of Achilleon Pharmaceuticals and our patients, families, and caregivers for providing their support for this program as well. Today's presenter is Dr. Leslie Ellis. Dr. Ellis is a medical oncologist in Winston sale of North Carolina and is affiliated with Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. She received her medical degree from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Medicine in 2000. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ellis. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining me to um, learn about uh, PNH. Um, we have a bunch of different topics that we're going to cover in the next um, hour to hour and a half, and it does look um, a little foreboding, this list, but we'll um, zip through it and hopefully um, um, uh, get to uh, content that everyone um, wishes to hear. Um, I do want to take a few minutes just to talk about how the body normally works in terms of uh, blood cell formation and the blood counts and the bone marrow. And so I am going to spend a few minutes on that before we get um, into talking directly about PNH. And so um, the, uh, in normal situations, the bone marrow, which as you probably know is the inside of our bones, um, is um, where all of our blood cells are made. And so uh, many times people think of uh, the bone marrow as the factory for making the mature blood cells. And just like if you were in a car factory, um, you need to have all the different uh, components of the car in order to make the final product. And the same thing is true with the bone marrow and the blood. And so um, even if um, you know nothing about what cells look like, I hope you all can appreciate that in this um, normal bone marrow sample, there are a bunch of different types of blood cells seen there. And that's exactly what we want to see in a normal bone marrow. And um, all of these cells contribute to formation of normal blood cells, which is what's circulating in our blood. So these uh, bone marrow cells normally reside in the bone marrow only, and then uh, they mature to form uh, the blood cells, which normally circulate in the blood. So uh, the bone marrow is the factory, um, and the blood cells are the final product of the factory. Uh, as I mentioned before, the bone marrow is the, uh, the hollow space um, um, inside our bones, um, which is where all of the blood cell precursors are, and so that's this spongy material seen here. And um, as infants, when we're born, um, every bone in our body is participating in hematopoiesis, which is just a fancy word for normal blood cell production. And um, we use a, a, a term to describe this uh, called cellularity, which represents um, the amount of bone marrow space that is filled with blood cell precursors. And so if we look at this picture on the bottom here, this is a slice of uh, bone marrow. And this pink area here represents cortical bone, which is the hard outer part of the bone. And then all of these little blue dots on the inside here represent uh, blood cell precursors. Um, so all of these uh, blue dot cells here are ultimately going to grow up to be mature blood cells. The um, white areas that you see here are actually fat cells. And it's normal to have some fat in the bone marrow, and this has absolutely nothing to do with how much fat we have on other parts of us. Um, and so when we use the term cellularity, we're looking at what percentage of the bone marrow space is comprised of blood cells as opposed to um, fat. 
And so um, a normal bone marrow cellularity, as a general rule of thumb, is going to be 100 minus the person's age. So if someone is 60 years old, then a normal bone marrow cellularity would be 40%. And what that means is that 40% of this space would be filled with blood cells, and the remaining 60% would be filled with fat cells. And so if we look at this example here, um, this bone marrow cellularity, I would estimate as around maybe 90% full. And so this would be normal if the patient was around 10 years of age. Uh, and let's compare that to this bone marrow sample up here. So again, we have the pink cortical bone. And then as you can see, there's very few blue dots um, which is how the, the blood cell, pre, the precursor blood cell stain in the bone marrow. It's mostly fat cells. And so this cellularity would be um, around less than 10%. And that's um, never normal um, for someone. So I told you the general rule of thumb is that a normal cellularity is 100 minus the person's age, but um, it the normal bone marrow cellularity plateaus around 20 to 30 percent. So even if someone is 90 years old, we would not expect them to have a bone marrow cellularity of 10 percent. We would expect it to plateau around 20 to 30 percent. And if we had a patient who was 100 years old, we would not expect their bone marrow to be 0 percent cellular. We would expect it to be around 20 to 30 percent um, cellular. Um, and so this concept of cellularity becomes very important when we look at different bone marrow disorders, particularly if we're trying to identify if someone has aplastic anemia or myelodysplastic syndrome, which are um, common disorders that can overlap with PNH. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that uh, I said previously that um, when we're infants, uh, this bone marrow um, blood cell production is occurring in every bone in our body, but by the time we reach adulthood, it's only um, the pelvic bones and the proximal parts um, of the long bones that are participating in blood cell formation. And so if any of you have ever had a bone marrow biopsy before and you've wondered why you've had it um, on your back hip bone, um, that's why, because that's one of the few bones that's actually participating in blood cell production. And so if we want to get a look at that blood cell factory, if we want to see what's going on with blood cell production, then that's when we have to take a look in the bone marrow and we do that with the bone marrow biopsy. Uh, this is a picture of the hematopoietic tree, and um, we start at the top of the tree with the pluripotent stem cell. And so um, this is a, a blood cell uh, that has the capability to become any and all types of blood cells. Um, and as you work your way down the tree, um, the blood cells are going to mature. And then by the time we get to the bottom of the tree, we have represented the most mature cell of each different type of blood cell, okay? And I want to point out that this horizontal line here represents um, cells that should only normally be found in the bone marrow, which would be all of the less mature cells, um, and cells that are only supposed to be found uh, in the peripheral blood or in the circulating blood in normal situations, and that's represented by the cells below this horizontal line here. And so again, what we see is that we have um, a red blood cell, and then these represent all of the red blood cell precursors that are required for development um, of red blood cells um, in the bone marrow. We have our platelets, and then we have some uh, different types of white blood cells, which are the rest of the cells shown here. Uh, we have a monocyte, a neutrophil, an eosinophil, a basophil, and some different types of um, lymphocytes, B cell, T cell, and natural killer cell. And so all of these different cells are different types of white cells. And so we have our white cells, um, our red blood cells, and our platelets, which are our three main cell types. But again, the important concept is that all of these precursor cells, these less mature cells, should normally only be found in the bone marrow. And their goal in the bone marrow is to mature and to spit out into the peripheral blood the mature form of each cell line. These are just some other cool blood facts. Um, I love talking about the blood in case you can't tell, so I'll try to throw in as much information like this as, as I can. But um, the, um, you can see that whole blood is almost half blood cells. Um, the rest of it is the non-cellular components um, of the blood, or what's called plasma, and this includes um, electrolytes, 
um, different chemicals, some of the clotting factors, that type of thing. Um, the average male has about 12 pints of blood compared to nine pints in the average female. And just to give you a sense of what our bone marrow does on a daily basis is um, every single day it makes 10 to the ninth white blood cells. That's the number one followed by nine zeros. It makes that many white blood cells every single day. Um, and then 10 to the 11th red blood cells every single day and 10 to the 11th platelets, again, every single day. So our bone marrow is doing a lot um, to maintain our blood counts, um, even in a normal situation. Normally, our bone marrow will make more um, myeloid um, cells compared to the red blood cells. Um, and the uh, amount of production of all of the blood cells um, can vary. Um, in certain situations. So, for example, um, if we get an infection, then our bone marrow may respond by making more of the infection-fighting cells. Um, if we were to go to uh, a high altitude and we needed more of the red blood cells to carry oxygen to the tissues in our bodies, then the bone marrow would respond by making more red blood cells. And then once that increased demand is met, and let's say we leave the high altitude um, environment or we um, get treated with the infection, then the activity is going to go back to that baseline, which was the 10 to the 9th white blood cells per day and 10 to the 11th red blood cells and platelets each per day. And the way our bone marrow increases activity is through growth factors, which are different chemicals that can stimulate different branches of that hematopoietic tree. And it's important to recognize that um, although we do get increased production in a different particular type of cell, in general, we're making only those mature cells, so only those cells that were at the very bottom of the hematopoietic tree. And um, in general, we don't want to see those immature cells circulating in the blood. We want those to stay in the bone marrow. It's also important to recognize that there are other cells besides blood cells in the bone marrow. Um, and these are termed stromal cells, and these include fibroblasts that help produce collagen, um, the fat cells, which I mentioned already, um, which are shown by the white spaces here, and then also endothelial cells because the bone marrow is a vascular organ, and so there are blood vessels going through it. And so this picture here shows a, uh, a picture of some bone marrow where a brown stain is used to identify a blood vessel going through the bone marrow. And then this is a picture here of a longitudinal cut of a blood vessel running through the bone marrow as well. There's also adhesion molecules to help the blood cells stay in the bone marrow and uh, different growth factors, again, which are used to stimulate uh, blood cell production when needed. So um, moving back to our tree then, so we've kind of generally talked about what's going on in the bone marrow. So again, all of these precursor cells, which are growing in order to make um, the cells um, that are circulating um, in the peripheral blood. And um, I'm sure all of you have had to undergo um, venipuncture um, to get blood samples obtained, but there are other ways um, in which blood can be obtained, and that's either through um, a PIC line, which stands for peripherally inserted central catheter, or a port. Um, and some of you may have this if you have high transfusion requirements um, or if you're uh, a, quote, difficult stick. Um, and so I just want to point out that there are additional ways to get blood um, aside from the uh, traditional way there. I also want to point out that um, there are um, different types of tubes into which the blood can be collected. And um, the different color top of the tubes represents different reagents that are in the tube in which the blood is going to be collected, and they all serve a different purpose. Um, and so, for example, for blood counts, those are typically drawn in what we call a purple top um, or a lavender top tube, which is shown here. And blood chemistries are typically drawn in either a red top or a gold top. And because, uh, for example, a gold top has a different reagent in it compared to a purple top, if um, if all your doctor gets from you that day is a purple top to look at your blood counts, um, they would have to go back and get an additional gold top if they wanted to look at your electrolytes if that wasn't drawn already. Um, so that's just to aid in the mystery behind um, what all the different um, tubes represent.
uh, a blood count is um, something that is probably the bane of all of our existence um, with this disease. Um, and so a CBC stands for complete blood count, and so that's the test that we order to, um, to look at the blood counts. This is automated, meaning it's done on a machine. The machine is called a Coulter counter, and it's shown here. And this can give us results in blood counts within a matter of just a few minutes, like typically less than 15 minutes. And what this does is this gives us the quantity of each major cell type. Um, so again, how many white blood cells, how many red blood cells, um, and how many platelets. Um, and then if a differential gets ordered, then that can tell us the percentage of all the different types of white blood cells that I indicated on the hematopoietic tree. And I just want to point out that this is the raw data that the machine spits out, but what your physician will get and what you will get is um, uh, something that looks like this, where you just get um, the uh, test, um, your actual value, and then what the normal range is for your lab. And then um, most um, machines are nice enough to put um, a flag um, by a value if it's uh, above or below um, the normal range. So when we use the term white cell count, we're talking about the total number of all the different types of white cells. Um, uh, and there is a, a normal distribution of all the different subtypes of white cells on a peripheral blood differential. So in this CBC, this white blood cell count, again, represents the total white blood cell count. And then if you want to look at um, the different subtypes of the white blood cells, that's represented down here. Okay, and so if you were to add all of these numbers up, then you should get a number that's equal to the total white blood cell count. A lot of times, though, particularly if people have abnormal blood cells, we like to have a human being look at the blood uh, cells as well instead of just the machine. And so um, a peripheral smear will be made um, of your blood that gets collected. And that's done by putting a drop of blood on a slide and then using a second slide to literally smear it across the first slide. And so um, this is an example um, of a blood, peripheral blood smear that's been made on a patient. And then we can look along this feathered edge here where it's nice and thin and then actually see the different cells under the microscope. There is a mnemonic, um, which I learned 900 years ago when I was in medical school, for what's the um, normal ratio of all the different types of white blood cells, and it's never let men eat baloney. And so what this means is that in a normal situation, approximately 60 to 70 percent of the white blood cells circulating in the blood should be neutrophils. Approximately 30 to 40 percent of the white blood cells circulating in the blood in a normal situation should be lymphocytes, and so on. So this is a mnemonic to help remember the normal ratios of the different types of white blood cells. And this is important is because if someone has an abnormal white cell count, if the white cell count is too high or too low, then the next thing that you should look at should be that differential to see um, either which cell is in excess, which is making the total white blood cell count too high, or which cell is missing, which is making the total white blood cell count too low. And so that's, that's the pearl um, when it comes to um, analyzing CBCs. You'll also get a, uh, many other um, values on a CBC, and some of you may have um, kind of puzzled over what, of these, what all of these are. And these are different uh, values that have to do with the red blood cells now. So initially we were talking about the white blood cells, now we're talking about the red blood cells. But really, um, there's only three that we use um, on a regular basis. And um, the first one is hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the protein that's contained inside the red blood cells that carries oxygen throughout the body. And it may be a little counterintuitive, but we really don't care that much about the red blood cell count when we're talking about anemias or things like that. What we care about more is the hemoglobin, which again is the protein that's carrying oxygen throughout the body. So I never really look at this red blood cell count, but I do focus on the hemoglobin. And then the mean cell volume we'll talk about a bit, and then uh, the red cell distribution width. Um, just a little bit of information about red blood cells. Um, so you can see uh, this x-axis here is time, and then this is um, hemoglobin on the y-axis. And so what you can see is that uh, from the time we're um, – uh, a newborn, our hemoglobin actually drops a bit, it kind of plateaus, and then 
when puberty hits, one of the many changes that occur during puberty is that um, our hemo hemoglobins increase, and that's true um, certainly for males, less so for females, but definitely an increase during puberty. And so um, it's important to recognize that there are different normal values for men versus women, and it's also important to recognize that um, this should stay plateaued um, no matter how much we age. And so no matter how old we are, we would not expect our hemoglobins um, to drop. We should be able to maintain a steady state of hemoglobin production. So again, the hemoglobin is the amount of protein, um, that hemoglobin protein that carries oxygen throughout the body. And sometimes you may see hematocrit used as well. And this is a measure um, of packed red blood cells based on volume. So this is a sample of whole blood that's been spun down. And all of the red cells have formed this large pellet here. We have a few white blood cells um, identified there in what's called a buffy coat. And then this is that plasma, which is the liquid part of the blood. And so the hematocrit is the volume of red blood cells divided by the total volume of blood. And um, again, most times people don't use hematocrit, but in general, the hematocrit is going to be three times the hemoglobin um, on average. The other red cell index that we talked about is the MCV, or, or mean corpuscular volume, or mean cell volume. Um, we're using the term mean in this sense to mean average. Um, and so this tells us the size of the red blood cell. And so um, here's a picture of some normal-sized red blood cells that would have a normal MCV. This is a picture of some small red blood cells, some of which have abnormal shapes, as you can see here. Um, and so this is someone who would have a small MCV. And then this is a picture of some large red blood cells. And so when we compare the size of the red blood cells to this lymphocyte, which is this white cell here, you can appreciate how many of these cells are larger than a lymphocyte, um, whereas a normal lymphocyte should be slightly smaller than the size of the nucleus of a lymphocyte. And so when we make that peripheral smear and we look at the cells under the microscope, we can confirm what the MCV um, shows on the machine. And then I don't have a slide for it here, but RDW, or red cell distribution width, is oftentimes looked at in correlation with the mean cell volume. And the red cell distribution width just tells us how much variation is in the size of the red blood cells. So regardless of what their actual size is, if there's a lot of variation in the size of the red blood cells, then the RDW will be high. And if there's not a lot of variation in the size of the red blood cells, so they're all pretty much the same size, regardless of whether they're small, normal, or large, then the RDW is going to be low. And we use that information along with the MCV if we're trying to interpret a certain type of anemia that someone may have. Also under the peripheral smear, we can look at the uh, the shape of the red blood cells or the morphology. And so a normal um, red blood cell um, is shaped like a biconcave disc. And so this is a good example of a normal red blood cell. Uh, and so you can appreciate that central pallor, so that, that light area, which should be uh, approximately one-third the diameter um, of the uh, red blood cell. But on this example, we can also see some abnormal shapes here, some really small red blood cells. Here's some more abnormal shapes. This one looks like a helmet. And so looking at the cells under the microscope with our own eyes really gives us a lot of information um, if someone has an anemia. There's also um, another blood test that can be ordered. So this will not be routinely done if, if your doctor orders a CBC. This is something that has to be ordered separately. And, and this is a reticulocyte count. And a reticulocyte is uh, uh, part of the red blood cell lineage, and it's one stage less mature from the most mature red blood cell. So uh, with just a little bit more time, a reticulocyte is going to turn into a mature red blood cell. And this is an example of a reticulocyte here. You can see that it's larger than the mature red blood cells, and it also has a little bit of a bluer hue to it. And so we can recognize reticulocytes um, just by looking at the peripheral smear, but oftentimes we may do an additional stain called methylene blue um, to help um, um, identify reticulocytes. And reticulocytes really help us determine if people are anemic, which is a term that means we don't have enough hemoglobin or red blood cells, um, because of a production problem or a destruction problem. 
Um, if people are having a production problem and, may, and not making enough red blood cells, then they're probably not going to have enough reticulocytes either because reticulocytes are part of the stage of maturation of, um, of normal red blood cell production. But if people are having a destruction problem with their red blood cells, so if their red blood cells are getting destroyed in the spleen or in the in the lumen um, of the blood vessels, then they're producing the red blood cells fine, and you may actually see some of these reticulocytes circulating in the peripheral blood to try to compensate for the increased destruction. And we'll go over that a little more as we um, um, talk about uh, PNH. And then finally, the platelets can be counted off the peripheral smear. So they're the little tiny blue dots um, seen there. Um, this is a higher magnification, so you can appreciate it, but this, uh, these little granular things um, are the platelets. This is a really big platelet, this one, but these um, are about normal size. And so we can look at the uh, peripheral smear that we made and then get a sense of what the platelet count is to confirm um, what the machine is reading. So <clears throat> getting back to the bone marrow, so some of you may have had uh, a bone marrow biopsy and aspirate. And again, typically it's done um, on the back hip. Uh, either side is fine. And again, the reason why that's the um, place to go is because as adults, we are primarily making our blood cells um, in our, our breast bones, our pelvic bones, and then the proximal parts of our long bones. Um, and so the pelvic bones tend to be the place of choice to obtain a bone marrow biopsy and aspirate because they are obviously a lot flatter than um, our round bones and a little bit of um, pressure is required in order to get the sample. And so when we do a bone marrow biopsy, we typically take two types of samples out. We take um, a liquid part, which is called the aspirate, and then a solid part, which is called the core. And this liquid part here, you can see it looks just like venous blood. Um, and it's really difficult to tell with a naked eye um, that it's a, a bone marrow aspirate sample, but we certainly can tell the difference once we look at it under the microscope. And then this little solid part here is just a little cylinder of bone, a little um, kind of like a soil sample, um, a little core of bone that we take out. And so with the liquid part, with the aspirate, we make a smear just like we can do of the peripheral blood, and we can also um, look at this under the microscope. And so here's an example of um, two different bone marrow aspirates. And uh, again, this one, hopefully you can appreciate, has a bunch of different types of blood cells in it. So this has all the different parts um, of the car that we need to make the car in our factory. Whereas this uh, bone marrow down here, I hope you can appreciate, really has only one type of cell. We don't see a lot of variation in the types of cells like what you see in the top example. And so this top example would be um, from someone who has a normal bone marrow, where this bottom sample would be from someone who has an abnormal bone marrow. It's like all they have in their factory are windshield wipers, so they're not going to be able to make a car. With the solid part, we make little slices of it and we look at it under the microscope and this is where the cellularity comes from, which again is how full is the bone marrow um, of blood cells versus fat. And so again, this pink part here represents the cortical bone, which is the hard outer part of the bone. Um, and then all this blue area represents um, millions of, of tiny little blue dots, which represent blood cells. And then these white areas represent uh, the fat cells. So I would give um, this cellularity, an estimate of about 90 to 95% cellular. So now that we understand a little bit about the bone marrow and the blood cells, I want to talk about the concepts of bone marrow failure. Um, and we may not think about it a lot this way because the bone marrow is not in one um, one place, like a kidney or a lung or a heart, but the bone marrow is an organ, just like those other organs, and it can fail or stop working, just like those other organs can. And the consequences of the bone marrow failing can be just as life-threatening as with any uh, as when any other organ fails. And there are three main disorders that are associated with bone marrow failure, aplastic anemia, PNH, and myelodysplastic syndrome. And so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about um, aplastic anemia and MDS before we move on to PNH. <clears throat> 
So if we go back to our hematopoietic tree, um, with aplastic anemia, this pluripotent stem cell is damaged. Um, and so if it's damaged, then it cannot uh, grow and make more of itself. And if it can't make more of itself, then there, you're not going to have enough cells that will eventually mature and make enough of these mature blood cells that are supposed to be circulating in the blood. And so people who have aplastic anemia have the potential to have um, a decrease in all three cell lines. So again, the red blood cells, the platelets, and then these white blood cells. And so the term anemia is actually a bit of a misnomer because um, people can develop what we call pancytopenia, which means a drop in all of the cell lines with aplastic anemia. Some people are born with aplastic anemia, but most cases, certainly in adults, are acquired. Um, and there's been something that's happened to, um, to affect that pluripotent stem cell. And so um, certainly large doses of radiation and chemotherapy can do it. Uh, certain medications can do it, and I have a list here of uh, some medications that have been associated with aplastic anemia. This is certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, Certain viral infections can be associated with aplastic anemia and um, different immune disorders. Um, but the primary cause for aplastic anemia is um, idiopathic, and that's a fancy term that uh, we use in medicine, which means that we don't know <laughs> why someone um, has this problem. We think that the uh, mechanism of um, the uh, stem cell destruction in aplastic anemia is immune mediated or autoimmune. And there's a bunch of um, supporting evidence that makes us think that. And again, this is not an exhaustive list, but we know that um, if we s give people medicines that suppress their immune system, that that can actually cause an improvement in their blood count. Um, and so that's one of the main ways, um, one of the main reasons as to why we think that aplastic anemia is immune mediated. But we think that um, there's some drug or some viral infection or some unknown antigen. Again, for most people, we have no idea why they get it. But it leads to activation of their lymphocytes that um, end up inappropriately destroying that pluripotent stem cell at the top of the hematopoietic tree. So what the bone marrow will look like then in someone who has aplastic anemia is um, tumbleweeds. Okay, it's going to be crickets and tumbleweeds is what I tell the medical students. And so um, this top panel here represents um, a bone marrow from a, a normal patient. And so we can see all the little blue dots that represent uh, blood cell precursors. Um, and then the white spaces represent the fat cells. And so if I had to estimate the cellularity of that bone marrow, I would say it's maybe 60, 50 to 60%. So if the person was 40 to 50 years of age, that would be a normal bone marrow. But if we look at this bone marrow down here, again, we see very few blue cells, and the vast majority of space is taken up by the fat cells. And again, this is not because the person is overweight or anything like that. It's because the bone marrow has stopped producing those blood cells, and so the fat cells can just spread out and take over. And so this person has a cellularity of around less than 10%. Um, and so uh, remember we said that there is no age um, at which that would be a normal bone marrow cellularity, but this is the type of bone marrow that we can see in people who have aplastic anemia. Um, and so they're just missing all of those blood cell precursors in the bone marrow because that pluripotent stem cell has been destroyed. And so if we think about what uh, the blood counts are going to look like then in someone who has aplastic anemia, um, everything is going to be low. So we use the term leukopenia, which means that they have a low total white cell count. Those patients can be neutropenic, which means they have a low number of neutrophils, which are the main uh, blood cell that helps us fight infection. They'll be anemic, which is a drop in the red blood cell count in hemoglobin. Um, and they'll be thrombocytopenic, which means that they have a low platelet count. And again, um, the reticulocyte count in these patients um, is going to be low because, remember, a reticulocyte is one stage uh, less mature than a mature red blood cell. And so in people who have a production problem, such as aplastic anemia, then not only are they not able to make mature red blood cells, but they're not able to make all of those steps of red blood cells leading up to a mature red blood cell. And so their reticulocyte count is going to be low because they have a problem with their pluripotent stem cell.
the treatment for aplastic anemia. So if if you think that uh, if we think that um, like someone started a medication and then that's when their counts started to acutely drop, then we want to withdraw that potentially offending agent to see if their counts improve. But again, this this is uh, the case in, in an extremely small percentage of aplastic anemia patients. Um, again, for most patients, it's idiopathic or uh, what we think is immune mediated. And so we do something called supportive care, which means we try to um, act for the bone marrow since it's not doing its job on its own. And so um, we can't transfuse the infection-fighting cells, but we can use antibiotics to help patients um, from getting uh, infections, what's called prophylactic antibiotics. Um, and then what we can also transfuse the red blood cells and the platelets. Uh, and so this is to prevent complications from not having enough of those good blood cells. Um, but to try to improve the bone marrow function, um, we use immunosuppressive regimens, and a very common one is one called ATG, cyclosporin, and solumedrol, um, which is typically given in the hospital for five days. Um, and so, again, this, these medications suppress the immune system to um, suppress whatever um, uh, immune-mediated um, destruction of the pluripotent stem cells is going on um, and then uh, hopefully allow for the bone marrow to produce um, more blood cells on its own. Um, but the, the only definitive or curative treatment for aplastic anemia is uh, a bone marrow transplant. Um, the term allogeneic means a bone marrow transplant coming from another person. And this is where very simply what we're doing is um, taking someone else's pluripotent stem cells and putting them in the person with aplastic anemia um, so they um, have those uh, precursor pluripotent stem cells that can produce all the different types of blood cells. Now, I use the phrase very simply. Obviously, this is a complicated process and, and has a, a lot of risk associated with it, but that's the only curative treatment for aplastic anemia at this point. Now, I'd like to shift gears a little bit and just spend a few minutes to talk about myelodysplastic syndromes, which is another disorder that can overlap with PNH and is also um, one of the bone marrow failure um, disorders. And um, when People have myelodysplastic syndromes. Um, what the way I like to define it is what's called um, ineffective hematopoiesis or ineffective blood cell production. And so again, if we go back to our hematopoietic tree, um, all of these um, blood cells are supposed to mature in a nice orderly fashion to produce the most mature form of each cell line um, shown in the peripheral blood. People who have myelodysplastic syndrome, the cells may be stuck at the toddler stage or stuck at the teenager stage, but they have a harder time making it to adulthood, again, where adulthood represents the most mature cell um, seen in the peripheral blood. And so because of that, the bone marrow is actually hypercellular, meaning it's more full of precursor cells than it should be. Um, even though they have low blood counts. And a lot of times that can be counterintuitive. You would think that if the bone marrow is too full, then there must be, you know, if anything, too many cells. But because these cells are not maturing appropriately, because they're getting stuck at the toddler stage or the teenager stage, because this maturation is ineffective, then it takes more uh, cells, more bone marrow space, in order to produce uh, the same number of blood cells, and in fact, what we see with MDS is that they oftentimes they can't even produce the same number um, of blood cells, and so these patients will have low blood counts. So as opposed to aplastic anemia, where people will have low blood counts with an empty bone marrow, people with myelodysplastic syndromes will have low blood counts with a bone marrow that's fuller than it should be, that's more full than it should be. People with MDS can present with any of these signs and symptoms that have to do with not having enough of the good blood cells. So they may have, and this is also true for aplastic anemia, by the way. So they may have recurrent infections because they don't have enough of those good infection-fighting cells. They may have fatigue or pallor, which means they look pale, because they don't have enough of the red blood cells that's carrying oxygen throughout the body. Uh, and then they may have um, bleeding or bruising problems because they don't have enough of those platelets that help the blood clot. Um, so there are signs and symptoms that people present with um, have to do with not having enough of the good blood cells because they're, uh, they have ineffective hematopoiesis. Uh, 
the way we diagnose MDS and also the way that we diagnose aplastic anemia is that we have to do a bone marrow biopsy. We have to look inside the factory to see what's going on. So someone with aplastic anemia and MDS could have blood counts that look the exact same, yet their bone marrows would look very, very different. So someone with aplastic anemia would have an empty bone marrow, whereas someone with MDS would have a bone marrow that's too full. In addition, with MDS, the cells can be dysplastic, which is a fancy term for not looking normal. And so we know what normal precursor blood cells should look like. And um, so if, if they don't look normal, then we call that dysplasia, and that would be a sign that someone might have MDS. Um, also, they can have an increased number of blasts, which are one of the types of baby blood cells. So again, this is for people where their uh, maturation is stuck at the, at the baby stage. And then we also do these special tests where we look at the chromosomes in the bone marrow cells, which can help us with prognosis with myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, this is the latest um, World Health Organization classification scheme of MDS. Um, I show this just to say that there are many different types of MDS. So if one of you has MDS, your doctor may tell you that you have, for example, RCMD MDS, which would be refractory cytopenias with multilineage dysplasia, whereas you may, you may know someone who has RAEB1 MDS. They're both considered to be MDS. It's just different criteria for those. And so I just show that here to help uh, understand um, uh, how the disease is classified. We treat patients with MDS somewhat similarly to how we treat patients with aplastic anemia. So, again, we want to assume the function of the bone marrow while it's not producing enough of the good blood cells. So we'll use antibiotics because they're good infection-fighting cells, maybe low, and we'll transfuse red blood cells and platelets um, because they're not making enough of those. We may administer um, growth factors, which normally help the cells mature down the different branches of the tree. Um, it's not uncommon for people with myelodysplastic syndrome to get iron overloaded. So if you get a lot of packed red blood cell transfusions, then that has some iron in it. And so a lot of times um, as people's transfusion requirements continue for long periods of time, then iron can build up in the body. And so we have to use different medications to help you excrete that iron so it doesn't build up and cause problems. There's also some gentle outpatient chemotherapy that can be used in, in certain types of MDS. And really the big thing with MDS is to monitor for transformation to a different type of blood problem called AML, which stands for acute myeloid leukemia. And acute myeloid leukemia is um, a very aggressive type of blood problem that has the potential to be life-threatening. And so it's something that we, that we don't want to miss. And so we know that people who have MDS have the potential to transform into AML, and so it's something that we uh, want to keep a close eye on. So now, after all that, let's let's uh, start talking about uh, what we came to talk about, um, which is PNH, uh, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer because um, the pathophysiology of the disease is not paroxysmal, it's not nocturnal, and um, about 26% of people are going to present with the dark urine or the hemoglobin in the blood. So the name uh, came to be, I believe, around 1867, which is when the disease was first diagnosed. And so back then, um, um, these words were um, accurate for the patients that they were identifying, but now that we know so much more about um, what causes the disease and what's the underlying pathology with the disease, we recognize that uh, these terms aren't entirely accurate anymore, but um, nevertheless, the name has stuck. Um, it's important to recognize that this is a very rare disease, which I'm sure um, you all are aware of now. Um, but there's anywhere from four to 6,000 cases um, estimated to be in the United States. And just to give you a comparison to put that in perspective, there's um, over a quarter of a million new cases of breast cancer diagnosed each year in the United States and over three quarters of a million of people who will have a stroke in the United States each year. So that's just, that's just to give you a sense of exactly how rare of a disease it is we're dealing with. Um, this is a disease that's diagnosed in all ages. The median age is in the early 30s, but I certainly have seen people as old as, as their 80s with it. Um, and it does have uh, a fair amount of morbidity 
associated with it, so uh, complications that can adversely affect quality of life, as well as uh, mortality associated with it. So PNH is due to an acquired mutation in um, a gene um, in the pluripotent stem cell. Okay, so uh, the gene that has a mutation is called uh, Pig A, and that stands for phosphatidylinositol glycan anchor biosynthesis class A. So if you all are okay with this, I think I'll just use the term Pig A from here on out, so I don't have to say all that. Um, but again, this is an acquired mutation in the Pig A gene in the pluripotent stem cell. It is only in this stem cell, as well as all of the cells that are derived from this pluripotent stem cell. It is not in any other cell in the body, this mutation, which means it's not in your skin cells, it's not in your liver cells, and it's not in your egg or sperm cells, so it's nothing that you can pass on to your children, and it's nothing that you've inherited from your parents. Um, this gene is located on the X chromosome, and we've documented many different types of mutations in this pig A gene. Um, and the cause of the mutation, no matter which type it is that you have, is unknown. So as far as we know, it's not because of anything that you ate or drank or smoked or did or didn't do. Um, people just develop this mutation. We do know that the job of this pluripotent stem cell is that it has to um, self-replicate. It has to make more of itself in order to populate the bone marrow. And every time uh, the bone marrow, uh, excuse me, every time this pluripotent stem cell um, duplicates itself, it has to duplicate all those genes perfectly. And so um, it could be that as it's duplicating its DNA, it makes a mistake, which results in a mutation in the pig A gene. But as far as we know, it's not because of anything that you were exposed to or anything, um, you know, any behaviors that you did. And what this pig A gene encodes for are some proteins that are called GPI anchors. And GPI stands for glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol. And so, again, if you guys are okay with it, I'm just going to use GPI so I don't have to keep saying that. <laughs> and so what these GPI anchors do is um, attach different proteins to the cell surface. And so if we look at this picture over here, um, this represents the lipid bilayer cell membrane of what in this picture is a red blood cell. And so what the pig A gene encodes for is this protein here called the GPI anchor. And what it does is it attaches other completely different proteins to the cell surface. And so if people have a mutation in this pig A gene, then they are unable to make these anchoring proteins. And if they can't make these anchoring proteins, then they cannot attach these proteins to the cell surface. The body makes these proteins just fine. It makes a perfect amount and they function normally. It's just that the body has no way of attaching these to the blood cells. And so in effect, it's like the body isn't making them. And the two main proteins that um, need to be attached to the blood cells in terms of PNH are two proteins called CD55 and CD59. So normally CD55 and CD59 are attached to the blood cell membrane via these GPI anchors. But if someone has PNH and they have a mutation in that pig A gene, then they are not making this protein. And so even though they're making their CD55 and CD59 completely perfect, they are unable to attach it to the blood cells. And so the CD55 and CD59 are important to PNH because of the function that they normally serve in the body. And so this is a picture of a complicated pathway called the complement cascade. And very simply, the complement cascade keeps us from dying a horrible septic death, so dying of a horrible infection. <laughs> and um, CD55 um, is shown here um, as DAF, which stands for decay accelerating factor. That's another name for CD55. And then CD59 is shown down here. And so the way it works is that as you go down the complement cascade, then um, something called a membrane attack complex, or MAC, is formed. And a membrane attack complex is uh, something that literally pokes holes in the membranes of the cells. And so I have a picture up here that shows the cell membrane of a red blood cell that has uh, been attacked by the membrane attack complex. And hopefully you can appreciate all of these little holes 
um, in the cell membrane. And you can appreciate that as more and more holes get poked in the cell, eventually it's going to reach a point where it's unable to survive with so many holes poked in it, and so that leads to cell death. And so um, in order to prevent this from happening all the time, our body has made CD55 and CD59 to put the brakes on this membrane attack complex so all of our cells don't get holes poked in them. But in people who have PNH, because they have that mutation in the pig A gene, they're unable to make the GPI anchor proteins to attach CD55 and CD59 to the blood cells. And so um, they don't have these inhibitor proteins, and so the complement cascade gets activated, and then the membrane attack complex ends up poking all these holes in the blood cells, which leads to cell death. We use the term hemolysis or lysis of heme cells to refer to destruction of red blood cells. And um, very simply, what used to be inside the cell is now outside the cell because it has ruptured, because a cell membrane has had so many holes in it. And the primary thing that's in red blood cells is that hemoglobin, that protein that carries oxygen throughout the body. And so when the hemoglobin is no longer contained in red blood cells, we call it free hemoglobin. And um, free hemoglobin um, is a bad thing because... Um, Free hemoglobin binds up a chemical called nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator, and that means that um, it helps keep our blood vessels nice and relaxed and open. And so if we have a lot of free hemoglobin circulating around, then it's going to bind up the nitric oxide, and we're not going to have that vasodilator around anymore. And so then this leads to vasoconstriction or constriction of the blood vessels. And chronic and constant um, uh, vasoconstriction can lead to some of the signs and symptoms that people with PNH have. We also know that the constant complement activation that is occurring because the cells are not expressing CD5, CD55 and CD59 because they're missing the GPI anchors can also activate white blood cells and platelets. And anyone who has activated platelets is going to be predisposed to developing a clot. And we know that people with PNH um, are at risk for developing a clot. And there's actually a whole host of additional reasons as to why patients with PNH develop clots. But, um, but one of the main ones is because the platelets are activated because um, of all of the complement activation. So these are um, some common signs and symptoms um, that can be present in PNH. Certainly, people don't have to have every sign or symptom. You may not have any, um, but you know any combination is possible. But most of these um, are resulting from um, the mechanism that we just discussed. So the fatigue can come from um, being anemic, which is not having enough of that hemoglobin to carry oxygen to the tissues in our body. Um, that can also make us short of breath because we're not carrying enough oxygen around. Plus, if the arteries that lead to the lungs um, are constricted, then that can cause shortness of breath. And if little clots form in the lungs because our platelets are activated and that makes us more prone to developing clots, then that can also cause shortness of breath. So, um, all of these symptoms can be attributed to um, either the constant vasoconstriction that patients with PNH have or um, the propensity to develop a clot, okay, or thrombosis. Um, it's important to recognize, too, that there are um, different types of PNH. There's three types. The first type is classic PNH, and this is where the primary problem is um, hemolysis or destruction of the red blood cells because they don't have that protection of the CD55 and CD59 sticking to the red blood cells. Um, and these patients will not have any component of bone marrow failure. Okay, so it's all hemolysis. It's all not having enough of the red blood cells because they're being destroyed by complement, by the membrane attack complex that's like poking holes in the red blood cells. Another type of PNH is PNH in the setting of a bone marrow disorder. 
And so in addition to having some hemolysis, there's also a component of bone marrow failure. And so again, the reason why people with PNH can have a component of bone marrow failure is because remember, we said that this uh, mutation was an acquired mutation in the PIGA gene in the pluripotent stem cell. And so because all of the blood cells are derived from the pluripotent stem cell, then there's the potential for bone marrow failure because all of the blood cells are affected by that um, mutation. And then the third type of PNH is what's called subclinical PNH, and this is where we can identify some PNH cells, and we'll talk about how we identify those in a minute, but there's no evidence of hemolysis. And so sometimes this is seen in people who have a component of bone marrow failure, but we can measure a small amount of these PNH cells, but we don't really think they're causing any problems, um, which is why the term subclinical gets applied. Um, if you read the literature, um, what you'll see is uh, described as a median survival of 10 to 15 years, although that's based on old data, uh, data which does not include um, typically um, information about the um, complement modifying drugs that we have, like eculizumab or Solaris. Um, and we do know that people who have significantly low blood counts tend to do worse, and that's because uh, those people are at risk for developing complications of not having enough of those good blood cells. The primary cause of death for people with PNH um, is a clot. Um, I did spend a little bit of time of talking about overlap syndromes. Uh, about less than 10% of patients will develop a myelodysplastic syndrome um, or uh, acute myeloid leukemia. But uh, certainly more commonly is um, aplastic anemia. We know that a third of new cases of PNH arise from aplastic anemia versus what's called de novo PNH, which is people who develop PNH without also having aplastic anemia. So the way we diagnose it is to do a special test um, on the peripheral blood, so we don't need a bone marrow to diagnose PNH. Um, and we do this special test called flow cytometry. And this is a test <coughs> excuse me, that allows us to look at the pattern of proteins that are expressed on the outside of the cell surface. And remember, for PNH, what we said the relevant proteins were in terms of the pathophysiology of the disease is not being able to express uh, CD55 and CD59 because we have no way of attaching it to our blood cells because um, we're missing the GPI anchors. And so it can be a little bit confusing, but a positive PNH test is actually identifying cells that are negative for CD55 and CD59. So, uh, again, if someone has PNH, then that mutation in the PIGA gene is not allowing them to make the GPI anchors to attach CD55 and CD59 to the blood cell. So a positive test is a negative CD55 or CD59 on the blood cells. You may also have a FLARE test done, uh, which stands for fluorescent um, air lysin, and this is a reagent that binds directly to the GPI anchor. And so it's the same thing. So um, if you're getting um, um, a positive hit, then that means that that GPI anchor is present, and that would be not what we would expect to see in someone who has PNH. Um, there's three types of PNH cells, and some of you may be aware of this um, with your own diagnoses. Um, and again, there's a little bit of a confusing nomenclature. There's type 1, type 2, and type 3 PNH cells. Type 1 PNH cells are actually normal cells. <laughs> so as far as I know, I don't have PNH, and so all of my cells would be type 1 PNH cells, which means that um, all of my cells have those GPI anchors and are expressing CD55 and CD59. Type 2 PNH cells um, are cells that have a decreased density of the GPI anchor, and so they're able to attach some CD55 and CD59 to the blood cells, but, um, but not at a normal density. Uh, and then type 3 PNH cells are where there's a complete absence of the GPI anchors and therefore a complete absence of CD55 and CD59 expression on the blood cells. It's important to note that um, when you get this test done, you should make sure that your white cells get tested as well as the red blood cells because we know that hemolysis is such a significant component to this disease. Um, people may have um, a falsely low clone size if all they do is look at the red blood cell clone as well, um, whereas the white blood cells tend to give a more accurate clone size. 
Plus, if anyone has ever had a hemoglobin low enough to where you've needed a red blood cell transfusion, then uh, presumably you've received uh, a red blood cell transfusion from someone who doesn't have PNH, and so those normal red blood cells will dilute out um, your red blood cell, um, your PNH red blood cells. So that's why it's important to look at the size of the clone on the white blood cells as well. And again, I want to mention that uh, a bone marrow biopsy is not required for diagnosis of the PNH, but if we're concerned that someone may have a concomitant uh, bone marrow disorder diagnosis, like if we're concerned that someone may have aplastic anemia or MDS, then a bone marrow biopsy would be indicated to make that diagnosis. But to make a diagnosis of PNH in and of itself, a bone marrow biopsy is not required. So we always struggle with who should be tested for PNH, um, and we struggle with this for a couple of reasons. One reason is because um, the signs and symptoms, as you all can attest to better than I, um, tend to be pretty nonspecific. So, you know, there are many different things that can cause fatigue, many different things that can cause chest pain or abdominal pain. Um, but the other reason why we struggle with who to test is because this is such a rare disease. And in general, in medicine, you know, we want to start with common things being common. And so um, it's, it's certainly not uncommon at all for people with PNH to have a delay in diagnosis, uh, which, again, I think has to do um, not with necessarily having a poor physician, but just with um, having a disease where the symptoms are not very specific to that disease um, and in having a disease that's very rare compared to other problems. But I do have listed here some uh, groups which um, should be uh, considered to be tested. So anyone who has evidence of hemolysis, so breakdown of the red blood cells, um, with evidence of some of those red blood cell products in the urine, uh, maybe with some uh, kidney dysfunction because we know the kidneys um, uh, can be affected by PNH, then those would be people to consider testing uh, for PNH. I'm not saying that PNH needs to be at the top of the differential diagnosis list for that patient, but it certainly uh, should be somewhere on the list. Um, similarly, um, if someone has a diagnosis of aplastic anemia, I think that's common enough to where everyone should um, be tested for PNH. Um, if they have something called hypoplastic MDS, so remember I said before that MDS is a disease that's in general is associated with a bone marrow that's too full because the bone marrow is ineffective at making those mature blood cells. So there's a small subset of patients that have a hypoplastic MDS, which means that their bone marrow is actually emptier than it should be. And so those are people where they should be tested uh, for PNH. And then if anyone has a low blood count for which we don't have a good explanation, again, not saying that PNH should be tested first in those patients, but it should be somewhere on the differential diagnosis list for that patient. And then finally, clots. We know that um, up to 40% of people uh, with PNH can have a clot. And so we, uh, in hematology, we talk about explained clots versus unexplained clots. And an explained clot would be, for example, um, if someone had a bunch of risk factors to develop a clot completely separate from PNH, like if they were a smoker and on birth control and they took this long flight from Hawaii to uh, the East Coast and didn't um, stretch their legs or do calf exercises, we would say that would be an explained clot. Um, an unexplained clot is someone who develops a clot for which we don't have a good reason. And so certainly if someone has an unexplained clot with evidence of red blood cell breakdown or in an unusual site, uh, and so um, a usual site for a clot is a leg, what's called a, a deep vein thrombosis, or in the lung, a pulmonary embolism. So those are considered, quote, usual sites for developing clots in the general population. We know that people with PNH can develop clots in unusual sites, and so these are basically defined as any place other than the leg or the lung, but what commonly happens is that uh, people with PNH will develop intra-abdominal clots, so in the hepatic artery, hepatic vein, splenic vein, that type of thing. So if there's a clot in an unusual site, then PNH should be on that person's differential diagnosis list. Um, if anyone has an unexplained clot with a low blood count, then that person needs to have PNH on their differential diagnosis list. And if anyone has an unexplained clot and then they're not responding to the blood thinner treatment, the anticoagulation treatment to treat the clot and they develop another one, then that's when we should be thinking about PNH. Um, historical treatments for PNH are shown here. So um, these include medications such, such as steroids, which suppress the immune system, again, to try to suppress the immune response against that pluripotent stem cell. 
these patients can become iron deficient, um, and so they oftentimes need iron replacement. Um, they'll need transfusions, folic acid, which just helps with general blood cell production. But again, really the only definitive treatment that we had um, for PNH um, was a bone marrow transplant. However, now um, we have um, a um, new medication um, which um, fortunately has been shown to be very effective, particularly in the classic PNH, so the primary hemolysis type of, of PNH. And this is a drug called eculizumab or Soliris, which is a monoclonal antibody to C5. And so I have our coagulation cascade pulled back up here with CD5, uh, excuse me, CD55 uh, and CD59 circled here, uh, which are missing um, in people who have PNH. So they're missing these natural breaks to keeping the complement cascade from going and making that membrane attack complex. And so what eculizumab does is it's a monoclonal antibody to C5, and so it blocks the complement cascade at C5. And so if it blocks the complement cascade at C5, then this membrane attack complex is never going to be formed. So there are never going to be holes poked in the blood cells, and so the blood cells are not going to die. Um, the uh, dosing schedule for eculizumab is shown, is shown here. So uh, we do recommend that people get vaccinated for meningitis uh, at least two weeks before we start treatment. Um, and then there's an induction phase, which includes um, 900 milligrams weekly for four weeks, followed by <clears throat> a maintenance phase, which includes 1,200 milligrams um, every other week um, for here on out. Okay, um, So that's recommended indefinitely um, for right now. And what the data show is that um, when people get started on treatment with, um, with eculizumab, that we are uh, significantly controlling um, the amount of hemolysis that they're having. And so this is a graph that looks at, over time, um, what the level of uh, a chemical in the blood called LDH, or lactate dehydrogenase, is. And lactate dehydrogenase is a chemical that's in all types of uh, blood cells, but it's in uh, all types of cells in the body, but it, it is in the red blood cells. And so we can use the lactate dehy dehydrogenase as a surrogate marker for how many red blood cells are being destroyed. And so what you can see is that almost immediately after starting treatment with eculizumab, the LDH drops off precipitously, meaning that the amount of red blood cells that are being destroyed um, and producing that increase in LDH um, drops off considerably. And this is uh, a comparison arm, which are people who are getting sugar water, essentially. And so you can see that the amount of red blood cell destruction as measured by LDH drops off dramatically. Um, this is a different type of curve. It's called the Kaplan-Meier curve. And so we still have time on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is the percentage of patients um, who are becoming um, transfusion um, independent. And so what you can see here is that there are far, far more patients who were receiving eculizumab who, um, who uh, are delaying either the time to their first transfusion or becoming uh, transfusion independent compared to people who are getting the sugar water. And so again, what this means is that if, if people are having less red blood cell destruction, then we're having to transfuse them less. Um, and so that's what um, this graph is showing here. We also know that um, starting treatment uh, with eculizumab can improve people's fatigue scores. And so this is based on a specific uh, questionnaire that people fill out. And so basically the higher the score, the better the fatigue or the, the less the fatigue. And so what you can see is that after starting treatment, again, almost immediately there's a significant improvement in people's fatigue levels. Um, and then this data here is looking at the incidence of clot or thromboembolism. And so it's kind of a complicated uh, slide, but what we want to look at here are these numbers 7.37 and 1.07. And so the 7.3 value is the rate of developing a clot per 100 patient years in people who had PNH before they started treatment with eculizumab versus the clot rate per 100 patient years after people started treatment with eculizumab. And so you can see that the number of clots went from uh, 7.37 clots per 100 patient years before treatment down to 1.07 um, uh, 
clots per 100 patient years. So a significant improvement um, in clot development once treatment was started. There are also are um, some potential um, side effects from PNH, which again, I know you all can speak to better than I, um, but in general, it is a well-tolerated drug. And so, again, a complicated slide, but what you want to look at is, so over here is the placebo group or the sugar water group, um, and then this is um, people during the first six months um, of treatment with eculizumab, the second six months of treatment versus the whole year put together. And so you can compare, um, there's a slight uh, increase in headaches, for example, compared to people getting the sugar water uh, and some some runny nose, nasopharyngitis compared to people getting the sugar water. But overall, it was um, very well tolerated, certainly much better tolerated compared to people who are on uh, long-term high-dose steroids or have to undergo a bone marrow transplant. Um, so it's important to recognize that most patients who have the classic PNH where it's primary hemolysis are going to respond to treatment, but there's a subset of patients who will not. And if someone has a component of bone marrow failure, then um, they're not going to have as robust a response as people who have classic PNH. We also know that even if someone has classic PNH, that they can have flare-ups due to developing something, some other type of um, illness or uh, change in their life, which increases complement activation above the baseline. And so infection can do that. And so sometimes people will see a flare-up in their symptoms, even while they're on treatment, if they get what I like to call the crud, you know, or they get a head cold or something like that. Um, if they develop autoimmune diseases, then that can um, increase their baseline complement activation and can make people's PNH flare up even if they're on treatment. And then pregnancy, which is not a disease, but is but does put people in a complement activated state, um, uh, can um, cause people to have flare ups. And so there was a, a New England Journal of Medicine paper published about a year ago, which looked at. Um, um, how to adjust uh, Solaris dosing based upon pregnancy. And I have gotten uh, a young woman successfully through pregnancy who was diagnosed with PNH several years before um, she got pregnant. Um, and it's also important to recognize that um, there uh, was recently uh, described uh, a genetic mutation um, in 3.5% of the Japanese population, so I don't know if that applies to anyone listening. But basically, um, it's a mutation in... Um, C5, or which remember is that part of the complement cascade that that eculizumab binds to, and so if people have that mutation, then the structure of the protein of C5 is altered such that um, eculizumab can't bind, and so those people are not going to be responsive to eculizumab treatment. And then there's also a different genetic abnormality in uh, the CR1 gene, which can lead to suboptimal um, responses to eculizumab. So we're learning more and more about uh, this disease, about this drug, and about people who are receiving this drug. Um, and so there are, uh, this would contribute to an extremely small subset of people who are not responding to eculizumab, but it is important to be aware that those um, variances can exist. I do want to emphasize that if someone has PNH in the setting of a bone marrow disorder, that that person has two problems and that each problem needs a different treatment. Um, so um, if someone has PNH in the setting of their bone marrow disorder, so if they meet criteria for PNH, then they would get treated with eculizumab. But it's important to recognize that the eculizumab is not going to have any impact on the second problem that they have, which is bone marrow failure. So then you have to look at, do they need treatment for their bone marrow failure? And if so, then we would give them a treatment that would focus on their bone marrow failure. So if that bone marrow failure is aplastic anemia, then we would treat them with ATG, cyclosporin, and solumedrol, recognizing that that's not going to have any impact on their PNH. Okay? So if someone has PNH in the setting of a bone marrow disorder, then <clears throat> they have the potential um, to need two different treatments neither treatment of which is going to cross over and help the other problem. And then for the subclinical PNH, so again, by definition, it's not causing any problems. And so these patients are observed <clears throat> either um, until when or if the patient develops criteria for treatment for PNH. So um, people can have a PNH clone, but if they're diagnosed with subclinical PNH, then they don't meet criteria for treatment, and then we would just be observing them.
Uh, I do want to spend a minute to talk about the risk of meningococcus because it is so important. And so the reason that people are at increased risk of meningococcal infection is because that one of the ways that we fight off meningococcal infection is through the complement cascade. And remember, we're blocking that um, with eculizumab. And so this is why we want patients to get vaccinated at least two weeks prior to initiation of treatment. And then you need to get your boosters every five years to make sure that you stay up to date. And so because of this, um, fever should be taken seriously because we don't know if that fever is coming from a meningococcal infection, which you're not able to fight off um, like you were if you weren't taking treatment. And so <clears throat> I certainly recommend that all of my pa patients carry that little information card about meningococcal infection. And this is not because they may be encountering a doctor who is subpar or not good. But again, remember, we're talking about a very rare disease um, with PNH. And it could be that you've encountered, you probably already encountered physicians who have never heard of it before. And if they haven't heard of the disease and aren't aware, aren't familiar with the treatment, then they may not be aware that um, you're at increased risk from meningococcal infection because you're receiving that treatment. So despite um, the advent of eculizumab and uh, it's the way that it's really improved people's quality of life in terms of improving their fatigue and their transfusion needs um, and their clot formation, um, it's still only addressing the downstream effects of that uh, mutation. So remember, people who have PNH, um, they've developed this acquired mutation in the pluripotent stem cell in the pig A gene, which is making them not express the GPI anchor so they can attach CD55 and CD59. And so when we give people eculizumab treatment, which is binding to C5, we're not addressing that underlying genetic mutation that's present in the pluripotent stem cell. And so this is why people need treatment with eculizumab indefinitely, as far as we know. And so still, the only curative treatment for PNH is an allogeneic transplant, so a transplant from someone else. And so um, um, we have been doing allogeneic transplants far less in patients who have PNH since the development of eculizumab. And so the reason to do it for uh, classic PNH patients would be if you're not responding to treatment with eculizumab for whatever reason. Um, or if you have uh, a second problem, a bone marrow disorder problem, for which a bone marrow transplant would be the recommended treatment for that non-PNH bone marrow disorder. Those are currently um, the people who are receiving uh, bone marrow transplants now. And I do just want to finish with one slide uh, about new agents that are um, in the pipeline. So this is another picture of the complement cascade drawn a little differently than how I had it drawn before. Um, but all of these medications listed here um, are new drugs that are in development that are looking for additional ways to block complement activation, which has the potential to help people with PNH. And so all of these red lines with the bars represent, uh, signifies um, inhibition. And so there's plenty of additional drugs that are coming down the pipeline. But again, none of these are really addressing the underlying genetic abnormality that is um, causing the PNH to begin with, we still have to rely on allogeneic transplant for that. And so with that, um, I'll stop and I'll be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellis, for your presentation. We have a few questions, um, and if anybody would like to still submit a question, please feel free um, to do so. Um, our first question is regarding um, travel for PNH patients. Um, is there any particular precautions that PNH patients um, should consider before um, traveling? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I think the main the main thing to think about with travel is um, if you're on treatment, is can you avoid missing a dose of treatment? And so, um, I have one patient where she has new grandchildren in Oklahoma, and I'm in. Uh, North Carolina. And so she likes to go out there for several weeks at a time to help her daughter and visit her new grandchildren. And so we have made arrangements for her to be able to receive her eculizumab treatment there locally so she doesn't miss any doses. So I would say that's the main thing. In terms of like long flights and that type of thing, um, if you're on treatment and you're receiving treatment and you're not missing any doses, then there's not anything additional that you have to do. But certainly, even for people who don't have PNH, um, getting up every couple of hours and walking up and down the plane, um, doing the calf exercises where you're stepping on the gas, um, that type of thing benefits everyone. But there's not anything special that a PNH patient would have to do. 
Great. Thank you very much. Um, once a patient starts um, Solaris, is there a time frame that is expected for um, the patient and the physician to um, see if the um, Solaris is starting to work for the patient? Yeah. So, um, if you recall the um, graphs that I showed that looked at the drop in the LDH, you can see that it drops off very quickly and almost almost immediately and quite precipitously. And so um, complement is being inhibited almost immediately once people start treatment. And so um, this is going to be evidenced um, by um, an improvement in that LDH blood test as well as an improvement in the hemoglobin if someone has primarily classical PNH. And then there's some other blood tests that we can look at as well that measure hemolysis in general, such as haptoglobin and bilirubin and things like that. <coughs> I will say I tend to be a little lab heavy, and so I have my patients come every two weeks, and I get labs every time they come. And I have something that uh, all the nurses joke with me is called the Ella Special. And so that's a CBC with differential, um, a comprehensive metabolic panel that checks the bilirubin um, and an LDH uh, test. And I get those every two weeks when the patient comes. Um, the reticulocyte count I tend to get less frequently about every three months or sooner if I think that someone is not responding uh, like they should be. But um, if you're getting labs every two weeks, then, then you should notice um, um, improvements in those specific blood tests, um, certainly within a month. Okay, great. And how long after a patient starts Solaris um, would the physician maybe consider that the treatment, the patient is not responding well and would need to look um, to some other form of assistance for the patient? Um, are we looking at six months, eight months, a year? What's kind of the guideline that a patient would expect to say, okay, this isn't working and maybe I need to start looking at something else? Yeah, so I would say after two to three months, if I'm not seeing the changes in those blood counts that I would expect, then I start to investigate a little bit. I'm not saying that I would necessarily leave eculizumab, but um, I would start to ask myself why my patient isn't responding. And so, um, you know, we talked about, you know, that small Japanese population that has that, that mutation that can make them not respond, and then there's that other genetic abnormality in the CR1 gene. But, um, for example, I have a, one of my patients, one of my PNH patients, is a, um, he's a weightlifter, and he's like one of those big, burly weightlifters. And I think that he just metabolizes uh, eculizumab faster because his, he has a lot more muscle mass and, and so on. And so he actually uh, needs um, a higher dose of Solaris um, given every two weeks. Um, and I chose to do that instead of shortening the period um, of time that I give it just um, to accommodate his lifestyle so he could, you know, come in every couple of weeks instead of um, less frequently, or excuse me, more frequently. And so it could be that someone just metabolizes it a bit quicker. And so I would, within two to three months, um, if people aren't getting the response that I would like, then I would start to think about, do I need to adjust the dose? Do I need to adjust the frequency? And then I would say by six months, if I've, if I've been making adjustments and they're still not responding to treatment, then um, I, I would at that point consider seeing if I could get them uh, sequenced to see to see if they have one of those mutations, um, but I would really um, hate to move away from this drug because it is so effective compared to other treatments that we have. And so, but I would say within two to three months, if I'm not seeing the changes in those in those blood levels that I would expect, then I would start investigating and see if I need to adjust the dose or the schedule of uh, the eculizumab. Great, thank you. Does um, a patient being on Solaris um, who may potentially need to have a, a transplant, does that affect the success of a future transplant if the patient needs to have one? So um, the, someone being on eculizumab in and of itself, it's not going to affect someone's response to transplant or someone's ability to get a transplant. But um, there are um, a lot of potential um, bad effects that can come from transplant. And so before we send someone to transplant, we want to make sure that 
they're very healthy, they're functional, and that their other organs are working well. And so it's possible that someone with PNH could have damage to some of their organs, which may preclude them from getting a transplant or which may make a transplant riskier. For example, if they have some kidney dysfunction because of their PNH or some lung dysfunction because of their PNH. Um, then that might make it riskier for a transplant, but the treatment in and of itself will not. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, for aplastic anemia patients um, who, when they're diagnosed and they're tested for PNH and their results come back that they're negative, should they continue to be tested um, later? How, and how often is that recommended, if if it's recommended? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so um, the... Again, I tend to be lab heavy. <laughs> I like getting labs <laughs> because it gives me more more data and more information. But I would say if someone is uh, negative for a PNH clone and they have aplastic anemia, I would recommend getting tested once a year just to make sure that a clone does not develop. And the reason for that is, again, because we know that a third of people with aplastic anemia are going to develop PNH. Um, but another important point, which I don't think I, I uh, made during the talk, is that if someone has a small P so it's, it's it's possible that someone can have aplastic anemia and have a subclinical PNH. So they have a very small clone size of PNH cells, which are not causing any problems, um, and they have their aplastic anemia. And certainly in those patients, it is absolutely important to get um, their PNH test testing done at least on an annual basis. If someone ends up getting treated for their aplastic anemia with something like ATG, cyclosporin, and solumedrol, then they absolutely should get retested for PNH if their counts respond to treatment. And the reason for that is because if people with aplastic anemia respond to treatment for their aplastic anemia, then their blood cell production is going to increase. And so what this means is that their PNH clone size could in increase because they're now making more red blood cells because they've responded to treatment for their aplastic anemia. And so in those patients, they should absolutely be tested, typically more frequently than once a year, um, specifically once you start to see that their counts are responding from the aplastic anemia treatment. Great. Thank you so much. And that is all of our questions uh, that we've received today. And thank you very much again, Dr. Ellis, for your wonderful presentation and your time today. Um, I would like to remind everyone um, that the webinar will be available four to seven days from now to be able to watch um, on our website under our online academy. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank everyone for participating in the webinar today and making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please send us an email at help at aamds.org so that our patient educator can respond or visit our online academy and watch other interviews with experts and programs that may address your question. Just as a reminder, as we're done with the webinar, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. We greatly appreciate your time in completing this survey. Thank you again for joining us, and remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.